we want to give the most simplistic rule set of rules in a 3D form to a creative and let them determine where this fits in the workflow and let them break, explore, challenge our tool. Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Around Design. Today we have as a guest, uh, we have Shay, my co-founder and CEO of Gravity Sketch. Welcome, Shay. Hey, Danny. So, Shay, it would be great to hear, before we get started with this very interesting conversation that we're about to have, I would say, um, I would love to hear and get our audience to hear a bit about your background. Yeah, I mean, pre-Gravity Sketch, my career was much different than it is now. Um, I would say probably started in the creative space really early on. Um, I was always attracted to building and making stuff and I was initially an apprentice for a construction company where I was framing houses very early on. So I learned a lot about timber and timber construction. I'm born and raised in the United States. So most of the houses, at least on the West coast are, are timber made. And that gave me a really appreciation for like seeing something that was um, just a pile of wood become an, an actual structure that someone's living in. And, and that was really satisfying really enjoyed that. And part of that, as well as um, my grandfather was an electrical engineer, a military electrical engineer. So part of that, is, as well as my, my grandfather's background, led me towards a, a, a pursuing a career in making things. So engineering became my, my focus in my undergrad, mechanical engineering. So I studied that. I primarily focused on like structural engineering but unfortunately, I didn't get the, the project I wanted and ended up doing thermodynamics and wasn't too interested. So I decided after graduating, no matter what, I'm going to go straight into making and building again. And I was able to, to get a gig working for a furniture designer and uh, scaling up his manufacturing processes and just fell in love with the whole making and designing. Because with furniture, you have to really understand the design in order to make the, 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 the final product at scale. Um, I then served a couple of uh, interesting roles across the across the ocean in Taiwan and started to get deeper and deeper into designing of things and then finally found myself at a point where I felt I needed to really lean into the design side a little bit deeper and try to bring the engineering that I learned over the years to these design skills that I'm learning um, kind of ad hoc. And that's where I met you in, in London. I decided to apply for the Royal College of Art and Imperial College Innovation Design Engineering course as hopes to, you know, bring the two things that I was falling in love with together and under one umbrella. And I think they did a really good job of getting us in that direction. Uh, but the, the whole gravity sketch direction and creating a software, um, that was a bit of a left hook, but I'm really enjoying it so far. It's, it's been, been a journey. It's always really interesting to hear where people are like have come from and how they found design because it's usually in a very like serendipitous way. It's never like, you know, it's not a career that you always that everybody's telling you that you should pursue <laughs> probably because it's mm. always like it's a hard one to, you know, like to excel at and it's it's also kind of like one that is maybe going to be more passion driven than financially driven. So sometimes like even parents don't even agree with people going into that career. Um, in your case, I think it's really interesting how you've come from, because people find it eventually and they pursue kind of like the, the design route in a very like step-by-step -step kind of way. Like you eventually find that there's, you know, this course in university and you start course, like you're doing it and so on, but you've gone through engineering first, which means that you've your brain has been shaped in a way, at least in university, but then you've always been a designer at heart, right? So you've always kind of like had to complement those two things. And I think it's something very relevant to the conversation that we're about to have, because there is like, there's always this struggle with getting these two fields of creativity, which is design and engineering to speak the same language, to be able to create together, to be able to problem solve together. And most in most cases, it's just because one is not understanding the other one. And so if conversations were easier to have, to have, you would be able to create kind of like better products quicker. Um, so I, I think it's kind of like a really interesting 
mix that you have going on in your head, which probably is one of the reasons why Gravity Sketch has, uh, you know, become such a such a key tool for some of the some of the users that we have. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really know that there was a field called industrial design um, until I started working for this furniture designer and realized that he studied industrial design. And so, yeah, I mean, at least where I grew up, it wasn't that wasn't promoted. I mean, it was always like you could be a doctor or a lawyer or an entertainer or an athlete, and those were like kind of the the kind of careers that you would pursue, right? And that I didn't really fit any of those, and it, it's it's kind of strange that these aren't promoted to, to youth. Like no one's talking about being even a UI UX designer or something like this. You know, these are really relevant careers that you can build um, a really um, prosperous life on, you know, with your family. And, and unfortunately we're still kind of stuck in the, the cookie cutter type of roles that we know from society will, will yield a certain amount of financial returns, but satisfaction is kind of a different thing and like being satisfied creatively was something that I was really striving for. And with engineering, it's great, but you're always kind of working to a set of constraints that leave very little room for creativity. You can creative problem solve for sure, but I think completely challenging the brief is, is difficult for an engineer because often the brief has been challenged two or three times by the person that had designed the, the thing that you're about to try to bring to life. And so, yeah, they just kind of learned about, well, I want to be making some of these decisions earlier on in the process. And that's what really led me to discovering industrial design, which is what I'm in love with, although I haven't practiced for over eight years now. So, yeah, now at Gravity Sketch, it feels like these conversations can be happening much earlier with a wider group of people and having design discussions and making design decisions with a counterpart who understands the manufacturing process or the materials or maybe the supply chain that can help not only accelerate the product, but also accelerate the designer's learning and ability to bring their product to life, which is inevitably what I always strive for. I would love to see the thing that I sketched or that I was conceiving in the computer screen as a physical product. That was kind of the, the dopamine rush that I was looking for. And so hopefully having more fruitful discussions in 3D can yield those returns and results. I would say that engineers and designers do speak the same language, but maybe different dialects. And I'm not a native Spanish speaker, but I imagine when you travel to Spain, the Spanish that they're speaking in Spain, even in different regions, is different than the Spanish that you're speaking in Mexico. And even in Mexico, I'm sure the different regions have, have different Spanish, but um, ultimately it's the same language. And once you get to the common understanding and using other things like your gestures and um, maybe written if you need to will, are helping you communicate more successfully. And I feel like we're in the same position here when it comes to developing a 3D product, whether it's digital or physical, where we're using different dialects. We're doing engineering drawings versus industrial design drawings. And we're doing PowerPoint presentations versus huddling behind a screen and looking at someone's CAD model. Um, but ultimately, when you get the physical product in your hand, you, that is the truth. And so those foam models, those cardboard models, those real world prototypes, those are the things that actually align everyone together. Like this is the truth. This is the same language. And it's inevitable. Everyone knows that that physical thing is what we're going to make. So hopefully we're never going to have to use these different dialects in the future. And I hope we get one step closer to removing the need for a lot of physical prototypes. I don't want us to try to cancel physical prototypes altogether, but making a physical prototype that you're just using for visual confirmation doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, whereas you can make a physical prototype that you're using for m maybe more clear ergonomic studies and, and uh, maybe more clear material and finish understanding. So a bit of a long-winded Kind of response to your to your point there but i think it's relevant yeah and i think you're, you've touched many interesting points one the first one being yeah careers that are still kind of like these cookie cutter kind of careers in a way this what is what what this is resulting is is that people are having these different ways of expressing themselves. So what I mean by this is that the education system for example and the way that we're all brought up has been through 
thinking that you're going to end up being a lawyer or a doctor or like, you know, someone that is not necessarily going to be communicating visually or necessarily making something, as you were saying, you know, like you graduated and you wanted to just make stuff. Usually that's kind of like you have the art class in your in your like school and then that's it. Like everything else is just kind of like shaping you to to speak in a certain way, to communicate in a certain way, to use so certain tools. But then you go off and if you're lucky, you find the design field and you start going into this route. But everyone else has been taught to communicate and to express themselves and to understand the world and to communicate it through written language or through kind of like very structured ways of doing things. But then you have the other side of things, which are the designers that are more visual communicators that, you know, a sketch or multiple ones can communicate exactly what they have in their head, or at least try to get closer to that. But then you end up having other people that don't necessarily understand what's, you know, how to read these different images or how to communicate in that same way. So both of them are not necessarily able to kind of like input into each other's feedback and input and, 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 and problem solving and so on. So I think there's a, um, kind of like a problem there or a challenge there that obviously we're trying to figure out how to solve. You mentioned physical prototyping. That's kind of the thing that gets us closer to speaking the same language, or as you said, you know, like we're speaking the same language, but maybe not the same dialect. And these are the things that are kind of like helping us just shape that extra bits of, of things that we're not understanding so that we, we fully visualize what the other person has in their head. But obviously this takes a really, really long time um, or it becomes a really linear process or there's still a lot of problem solving that needs to happen even though you already have a physical model. So there's so many things that are flawed in the process because we're all just kind of like trying to tackle it with different tools. And so, you know, how do you think we, I mean, obviously at Gravity Sketch, we're trying to propose a solution. We have been, uh, you know, implementing the, the software with different customers. They've been adopting it. And we started to see kind of like these conversations flow a little bit better, but what is missing? You know, what are the things that are missing within the design teams, within the people, the stakeholders around the design process that can enable this to kind of like accelerate and get these conversations happening at the same, like at the, at the beginning of the process? We're not just trying to solve the problem. I feel like we're trying to bring more visibility to the problem. And a lot of people aren't really clear that this is a big problem. They're, they're obviously, they know that there's friction points in their workflow. Like I know that it's very difficult to take a 2D sketch and just hand that to someone and get a physical product in return. So I'm very conscious of that, but I may not be conscious of how those miscommunications cost time, also creative intent, and result in a subpar product at the end of the day. I might just feel like that's the process and I follow the process. And so I'm not conscious that there is a an alternative. And hopefully what we do as a business is, of course, help solve some of our customers' problems, but more than anything, at least in this juncture of our development as a company, we help spark these really clear conversations and identify, help our customers identify those challenges so that they can address them holistically. Because we never want to be the, the golden tool that you just wave, wave over everything and it solves all your problems. We want to help facilitate a whole new workflow. And so that's probably the biggest thing that I personally see when I'm going on site with clients is the ones that really get it and the ones that have the most success using our tool, they're, they're addressing their whole pipeline. They're looking at the whole way that they do things and saying, all right, we've been doing this for 25 years or 30 years, or in some cases much longer, and we need to think differently. We need to take a slightly different approach and we need to just get our feet wet and, and start. And other customers or clients are more like, I need to solve this particular problem right here. And as a result, they almost, they almost like push 
the product into an unnatural position or push their whole team into a natural position. And as a result, they might end up with some failures and then they think that they wasted time and then they don't adopt a new process and they revert back to their old process. And when I look at a customer like New Balance, it's just incredible. They decided to start from the beginning. What would it look like if our whole process was digital, was all 3D? And what would that give us? And they committed resources. I think they've been working for almost seven years on this initiative. We only got in more in more recent years with them, but they've been working for seven years on this initiative. And I, I think that's a really great way to to lean in and, and, and show leadership in an industry is being the first or at least being courageous enough to take this step. And so I would love to see more companies taking these steps. And hopefully what we do as a business is we provide a solution for a new workflow that they might be exploring and something that helps them save time and energy in doing a very long exploration into what's possible so we can help work with them, consult with them and so forth. But ultimately I think mindsets need to change. I I don't feel like we're gonna replace 2D sketching. I don't feel like we're gonna replace physical prototyping, but these conversations that are not happening together, but like through each other are not helping anyone deliver a better product within the day. And I wholeheartedly believe that every customer on site I've been at, everyone from the engineers to marketing, to product managers, to designers, they all want the same thing. They want to deliver a great product to the market and they want to find the best way to do it. And we hope that we play a, a good role in that. And we have for some of our customers. You mentioned I think two we have for really... all of our customers, I should say. <laughs> I think you've mentioned two really important things here. One is that we're focused on conversations, which sounds very weird for a software company, you know? Um, well, unless of course you're like, you know, a, you know, video conferencing, uh, platform and so on, but like, you know, that's the part that we're really interested in just improving, right? Like those in between moments that are happening when an idea is just, you know, created and, you know, another person needs to take over or understand it and like have something to do with that idea and like what's happening there in the middle, like what are these conversations, you know, how are they happening? And then the other thing that you mentioned with the example of New Balance is them adopting this digital 3D workflow. Then you start going into more technicalities, right? Like what is 3D and why 3D? And so then it starts to become a, you know, a conversation around is it about using these different kinds of software to create the final version of whatever product you're creating? And so, but then if you mix both of them, if you mix kind of like, you know, trying to figure out how these conversations are going to move more effectively with the power of 3D and why the power of 3D? Because, you know, we're 3D be like 3D beings living in a 3D world, interacting with 3D objects, designing 3D products. Um, so ultimately 3D is the most natural way we have to interact and express ourselves. So if we mix both of them, then you end up having that very kind of like magical com combination of just doing things very naturally. Um, it's easier said than done, of course, but I think that, yeah, you're, you, you've touched those two, those two very key points that sometimes people don't necessarily connect because when you start talking about 3D, you start thinking about these final types of software that will allow you to manufacture something. Um, but mm -hmm. you know, how do you think about this? How do you think about the, like the word 3D or like that, that way of, of working and how are we actually changing it? I'm really good in a few CAD software is like really, really good. And I really enjoy these tools. Like I love them because they're, they're able to give you a very clear understanding of dimensionality and of materiality in some cases. And you have this very machine like control, which is really exciting for specific things. And so I don't ever want to say that we're trying to replace these types of tools, but these tools are designed for final output. And it's very clear that they're designed for final output. A tool, um, even sometimes some tools, I won't mention the tool's name, but in the name, it's almost like prescriptive to what you're gonna do with the product, right? And how you're gonna manufacture. And as a result, we're training our engineers to, 
think through the tool of what's possible and what's not possible. And if a designer picks up that tool, they automatically need to think in that same vein, what's possible, what's not possible. And so when they think 3D, they're thinking, okay, I need to make some final decisions because I need to make sure that whatever is designed in this thing is going to get sent to a CNC milling machine and it needs to be millable. Well, that excludes all the ideas that aren't are maybe impossible to manufacture or impossible from the f mindset or from the from the constraints of that software, not necessarily from the human brain or the hu like what you gather all your stakeholders together. And so by completely abandoning that and just thinking about taking a simple stroke in midair and having a conversation in 3D together collaboratively, you now can bring in your team and your community around that and have a really detailed discussion of like, this is not possible. Maybe if we move this and this, it could be, or wow, now that we have something in 3D that we couldn't conceive before in these other tools, we might be able to address how this could work in this new material that we've been exploring or experimenting with. And so I feel that a lot of conversations aren't happening if you're starting or jumping from the page straight into these very constrained tools, which are great for that part of the design journey or that part of the production pipeline. When you think about the very front end of the process, we use pen and paper, Photoshop, um, Procreate, all these really great 2D tools because they're unrestricted in nature. And it allows us to be imaginative. It allows us to spill our brains onto the page. There is no 3D equivalent. There's nothing in 3D that allows us to do that. I think the animation and entertainment industry is getting close. They have these great tools where you can like pull and push clay apart, but you almost got to be an expert in how clay behaves, right? Because you have to understand the materiality of, of clay. But we all understand how to take a pen and make a mark. And the, the breakthrough for us started in 2013 where we were just able to turn a simple 2D sketch into a 3D perspective and then add another one and start composing because everyone can do that and everyone knows how to talk in lines. And so that was our first kind of entry into this conversation. And of course, over time, it's become a very powerful creative tool, but creation in our tool is only a means of communication. And I would argue that creation, even in a napkin sketch or creation, even in these CAD packages is a form of communication. You're communicating to others. You're communicating to a machine. Um, you're trying to get what's in your mind out and what's in the collective mind of your team out and into, uh, you know, a more formal state and potentially into a product that, that lives on the shelves. And yeah, there's so many conversations that can happen from ergonomic studies to, um, yeah, final formal kind of engineering drawings and things like this that can happen in our tool or engineering studies that I would be very hesitant. I am very hesitant right now to be prescriptive about what our software could or couldn't do or where we could and can't fit, where we should and shouldn't fit. I'm, I'm much more excited about watching how the customers and users use the product. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I saw something at an automotive company where um, one of the designers just sat in his chair and sketched all around him as if he was the driver and he had this really wonky 3d sketch and then he just took his arm and did this and he's like i know my reach now so i know where me as a driver i know what i can reach and what i can't reach and then based his interior design solely off of that that's something you can't do in any of these other 3d packages it's not even you can't even do that in any tool period so being able to provide these this, a platform for new ways of working and helping people challenge their creative workflow is, is absolutely the thing that drives us at least as, as founders and, and creators of the product. Yeah. It's just, I mean, we're very lucky to be working on a tool that it's meant for creatives because, you know, at the end of the day, you never know where they're going to take it. And you, you're, you're, you're saying something really important here, which is, you know, what is a sketch? What is like, is it just like a communication tool? Is it, you know, like sometimes we end up thinking about sketches as these beautiful pieces of art because we've spent so much time kind of like working on them because we need people to actually understand them, right? Like if you don't put the right, you know, shadows, the right lighting and so on, the dimension dimensionality is not going to kind of like come out and people are going to understand something very different, which means that you need to spend so much time working on that thing 
but then somebody will come later on and almost destroy it, not because they want to, but because they're not understanding it, or maybe you didn't really problem solve because we were so focused on putting the right shadows in there, um, as opposed to thinking about the problem that you were solving and the idea then on how to kind of like, you know, how to make that product solve that problem for, for a person. Um, same thing for CAD, right? Like you ended up thinking too much about how to problem solve or how to think logically so that the software does something like does what you needed to do that you stop thinking about solving the problem for the actual person that you're creating the product for. And so, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, how are we not only at Gravity Sketch, but how are like in general as an industry and uh, as, you know, like design teams in different, in different sectors are challenging the tools that we have right now, not because we should remove them, but because we should try to figure out what are the things available as well right now, these days that are going to help us do all of this without necessarily having to be thinking about the tool that you're using to create them, if that makes sense. One thing that's clear is like creatives, if you give them a tool, they're going to figure out the limitations of the tool and they're not going to use the tool in the way that you expect them to use it. An example is a hammer can be something that pushes nails into the, into the floor. It could be a doorstop. It could be a weapon. It could be a number of different, it could crack my crack some, some nuts. If you have walnuts or anything like this, you know, it's, it's, it's used in so many different, a variety of different ways. And that's not by design. That's just by humans. You know, humans will just find new ways of using something, a tool. And what's nice is that there is no clear conditions in which you must use that tool. There's only guidelines. There's a handle and a heavy object at the end of the handle. And what's great about that is that you, you leave this space for interpretation or you leave a space for projection of what the possibility is. I don't see that in the software space. It's really hard to see it in the software. Aside from the 2D creative tools, those are really cool because like there's a blank canvas and like you could just move your cursor around the screen and customize your brushes. That's cool. But I'm not seeing that as you start to get more refined. And I'm a big proponent. Like our company is founded on the idea of having a simple set of rules, but it feels like the set of rules is is not simple in these softwares and it's it's a long <laughs> list of rules that you have to follow in order to achieve something and so we want to give the most simplistic rule set of rules in a 3d form to a creative and let them determine where this fits in the workflow and let them break explore challenge our tool and i look at the landscape of even tools within our creative domain or targeting designers and you start to go up the hierarchy and it's very few companies that have creatives towards the top of the hierarchy. You'll have finance people and engineering and so forth, of course, but it's very rare that you see a creative at the top. And so ultimately the key decisions that are being made are based on maybe the, the company's bottom line or maybe an assumption of what the creative wants. And for as long as we possibly can, we're going to maintain a creative as the, the head of this company. And hopefully that helps us make responsible decisions for the creative and yeah, be part of the breaking of our product itself and challenging of our product collaboratively with, with our community. I don't know if that kind of responds to the point that you raised, but I think it's important to, to just call out the fact that we want to, lead designers by designers and this is a tool that we've always wanted or this is a, a way of working with a software company that we've always wanted that we just don't have and that doesn't exist right now yeah that's something really important it's um yeah designers doing a tool for designers you don't get to see that very often <laughs> you don't get to see a lot of designers kind of like founding tech startups um and just kind of like, well, you see some, but not necessarily making these sort of tools that will, in a way, it feels a bit egocentric or maybe not necessarily egocentric, but you know, like we're creating this, we almost are creating this because this is the thing that we would have loved to have 
when we were working in the industry, right? Like we've we've gone through the pains of having to communicate to express a third dimensional idea and like people not getting it and people destroying it. Um, and then having to go back to the drawing board because you simply can't find a way to express it, um, even to yourself, right? Because that's another thing, you know, like sometimes we just need to bring things out to be able to understand them ourselves and not necessarily just to express them to other people. But that's communication still, right? Like you're communicating to yourself and problem solving. What are, like changing gears a little bit, Shay, like what are the the challenges that you see right now happening? I mean, obviously we've been seeing different industries along the way, right? Like we've been working with multiple types of customers and so on, and each one of them has, you know, their own intricate kind of like ways of working and processes and issues and so on. But in general, what are the challenges that you're seeing first in how, you know, teams are communicating with themselves, like with each other, but also how are they kind of like pushing themselves to adopt new ways of working? You mentioned New Balance. New Balance has proven to be one of these unicorns that have started like very, very early on, seven years ago, where, you know, seven years ago, you were talking about adopting a 3D workflow for an entire, you know, company that would have been completely crazy to think about. Nowadays, it's starting to become a little bit normal, especially after the pandemic, but there's still, like, it's still a low, a slow process, right? Because the design process is something that we all cherish as designers. And so changing that, changing how things are done is very, very difficult. So what are the, the challenges that you see right now and how do you think or how have you seen some some of these companies starting to come like overcome them? Yeah, I mean, if we take ourselves out of the equation altogether and we just think about or talk about companies that are changing the way they work or, or challenging the way that design is done, there's a common thread that I see, and there's two ways that they do they go about this. One way is that you have a visionary at top, and, and more often than not, the designers that decide to join those companies really are inspired by the visionary. And so they're, everyone's kind of bought onto the singular vision of like, it may not be process change, it might be a new way of designing or a new approach to designing or sustainable design, right? It, it could be a number of these different themes that are permeating through the design industry. And it's really about aligning behind that that leadership. And the other way is a more guerrilla. And I see this a lot more where individual designers are saying, you know what, I have a little bit of spare time. I'm going to jump on this and I'm going to figure out how to wor work this into the organization. And they start to build this momentum. And then they start to apply pressure to the organization to change. And I think, I don't know which is best. I, I personally like the guerrilla. It's kind of my nature uh, as, a, as a designer, just being a bit more scrappy, a bit more guerrilla. But also it, it's a bit challenging because at the end of the day, you're still beholden to the, the powers that be within the organization to make those changes. So the perfect storm would be a natural movement of this kind of guerrilla moment, uh, movement happening within the organization. But then once the, the senior executive design leadership finds wind, cuts wind of this, you start to bring the, the, the pressure from the top and the bottom to the organization to affect change. And I would love to talk about examples. I don't want to drop too many, too many customer names, but our best performing account, we had about 12 people using Gravity Sketch, really early days Gravity Sketch, and they created some amazing work and even launched some products on the market that uh, the rest of the organization, at least from the design perspective, wasn't even aware of. And so by the time we reached design leadership, there were so many great proof points that design leadership was fully bought into the mission. And design leadership also had this vision of moving into 3D for many years, but never really found the right way to do this. So it was great, quite great to bring these two together and almost facilitate the connection between these two parties through our, our platform. And I would love to continue doing that, but no matter what it is, whether it's Gravity Sketch, whether it's a new material, whether it's being more sustainable, I, I ultimately think that the communication amongst the organization is absolutely essential what are we trying to achieve as a business and also communicate clearly to the team there is space for exploration within these areas and so there can be an open dialogue between leadership and um 
you know, the, the, the lower, lower, um, I guess, I guess, yeah, lower, lower, lower levels of the organization, which is the people that have to actually get their, their hands dirty. And once that starts to happen and you create that two-way dialogue, and we saw this at New Balance, right? The leadership is sitting down with designers and, and, and listening to designers. You start to see that there's an, an opportunity to accelerate the, the process or to find new innovations or to develop new ways of working and communication. I would say like we try to run our company a bit like a sports team in some effects where if the coach is not talking to the players and it's, the coach is not on the field demonstrating what he or she wants the players to do, it, the players aren't really going to have that alignment and synchronization. And like, you probably aren't going to have a very effective team. And so by sitting with the players, eating with the players, uh, learning from the players, you're able to have a much more harmonious, effective performance on the field. And that's ultimately what I think the design industry can, can, can do. And, and not just the design industry, but how do you connect with other members of the design function or of the production function? Like, yeah, connecting together. I, I remember working in Taiwan. I worked for a big OEM and engineers sat on one floor, <laughs> designers sat on another floor. And then in lunch, it was clearly divided in the cafeteria where engineers and <laughs> engineers and designers are sitting with designers. And I just feel like they're so close, but they're so far away. And ultimately bringing people together is going to lead to, to results. And as long as we stay separated, I, I feel like the change is going to be very slow. Yeah. How are you having those conversations if you're not sitting at, you know, lunch together and just kind of like casually like problem solving together instead of kind of like being super formal hundred percent. And like, that's something that is just, yeah, that needs to, to change quite a bit, especially now that products are starting to become more, way more specialized, have more technology in them, have to, you know, perform in a certain way, use certain materials that are very specialized and so on, you know, like all these sort of things, like how working in silos, this is not the way that it's going to happen. So yeah, definitely kind of like bringing, bringing teams together in some way and getting them to speak the same dialect, not the same language. Um, cool, Shay. So we're getting towards the end of the episode. And something that I would love our, our audience to, to listen to is, you know, Gravity Sketch sometimes is, is understood as a creation tool. And you mentioned creation is just a way of, you know, it's just the, the medium you use to communicate. But, you know, what is it that Gravity Sketch is actually trying to do? Like, what, what are... What is it? What is this tool? What is this platform? What is this company trying to actually achieve? I would say that we're, we facilitate great communication in 3D. We're the bridge between one stage of a project and the next stage. And everyone, that, all the, the stakeholders or whoever needs to be in each of those stages, they can, they can have these communication and, and aggregate and congregate within our, within our product. And so we just help great ideas become great products through great communication. That would be the summary I'd want to make. And of course, in order to have a, to bring those great ideas to life, you need to use creation, you need to use communication, and we have those things um, within our platform. And so, yeah, bit of a ramble there, but I, I think you get, you get the point I'm trying to make here. Yeah, it's, as I said, it's, it's easier said than done but it's also more difficult to say it. It's just like, in a way you need to leave it and, 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 and want to make a change in the way that you work and communicate, which doesn't come easy, especially if you've been working in the industry for a really long time. I was gonna say, I feel like what you said makes sense. Our, our community definitely lives it with us. Like that's one thing we didn't touch on is like, we're, we're learning and being informed by the people that have already adopted this way of thinking as well. And so it's not like we have to convert everyone's minds. Like there's people that have been thinking like this forever. And I, we always show this um, image internally of Pablo Picasso with the light drawings. You know, he was trying to show what was in his brain three dimensionally and in, in some medium just didn't have gravity sketch. So he had a long exposure camera and a light, right. Worked with a photographer on that. And you know, it's, it's, it's like, people are already have this energy to, to try to work in a different way and try to create a different way and try to communicate in a different way. And we're trying to build with them and be the responsible 
counterpart to to that conversation that's already in the ether. And to be honest, it's our responsibility as creatives right now. We started this project and we have to see it through to the end because we're both very much in love with design and would love to be making making products, but um, we've we've started something and we need to finish it and we're we're responsible to the people that have joined this journey with us and who have been thinking about this for years. Yeah, that's that's very true and definitely we we always say that we didn't invent anything new that you know this this has been in everyone's minds every creative's minds for like forever. We just happened to be the team that decided to do a project around it and ended up with with the great responsibility of making it come true. Um and we happen to live in a in a time where technology is actually allowing us to to help people express themselves in that way. So yeah, definitely like Shay and I would be, would love to be able to keep designing and we try to do it as much as possible in our spare time whenever we have. But, you know, like we've also fallen in love with helping people through their design process and through their way of communicating so that, you know, products end up becoming the best they can. Um, So in a way, sometimes when I when I hear a product that has reached the market that has been done with Gravity Sketch, or at least part of it has been communicated through Gravity Sketch, I I feel like at least you know like I have a little bit in there. Like I'm not the the designer there, but you know like you know a product was done or communicated through the tools that were you doing. So at least we have that. <laughs> And eventually we'll go back to industry Definitely. maybe one day. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All That's right. Hard. Well, Shay, thank you so much for for your time. It's been great having you. I think this conversation could just kind of like continue going over and over, like on and on and on because we have so much to say. Um, there's definitely probably a lot of like a lot of things that we would love to cover in terms of, you know, where we've been in you know the history of gravity sketch how it's all kind of like been evolving and transforming because obviously it hasn't been a linear process it has been a process as you said where we've put things out there and started working with the community started kind of like talking to designers talking to teams and really shaping the tool so it becomes something that is truly useful for someone like we never wake up thinking that you know, we want to put this feature or this other feature inside of Gravity Sketch. It's always come from really trying to be as empathetic as possible with with the community, with the users, with the people that are trying to bring their ideas to life um, and just having to figure out how to do it. Absolutely. Thanks, Danny. Look forward to the next one. Thanks, Shay. Bye-bye.